Here are nursing practice questions from 51 to 60. Please subscribe for more videos like this. The nurse is caring for an agitated client with dementia who is pulling at the oxygen and IV tubing. Wrist restraints are applied after less restrictive safety measures have been ineffective. Which actions are appropriate to protect the client from injury? Select all that apply. 1. Attach wrist restraint straps to the upper side rails. 2. Position the client supine to keep restraint straps taut. 3. Release restraints at regular intervals and assess behavior. 4. Use a square knot to tie restraint straps to the bed. 5. Use gauze to pad bony prominences under restraints. Correct answer. When caring for a client in restraints, the nurse should implement these interventions at regular intervals, according to agency policy, every two hours. Provide skin care and range of motion exercises, ensure basic needs are met, like fluids, nutrition, elimination. Assess skin integrity and neurovascular status of restrained extremities. Pad bony prominences under restraints, if necessary, to protect skin, option 5. Determine the need for continued restraint by releasing restraints briefly and assessing the client's reaction. Regularly assessing the need for restraints promotes discontinuation as soon as possible, option 3. Option 1. Restraint straps should be attached to areas that move with the bed frame, like elevates with the frame and head of the bed. Areas that do not move with, base, or move independently of, side rails, the frame should never be used, as injury may occur when they are raised or lowered, like pulling, entrapment. Option 2. Supine positioning increases aspiration risk as the client may be unable to self-reposition if vomiting occurs. Side lying or semi-fowler position promotes drainage of emesis or oral secretions. Option 4. Restraint straps should be tied in a quick release knot, in case of emergency, and never in a square knot which is difficult to release quickly. Educational objective. Nurses caring for restrained clients must ensure that basic needs are met. Assess skin integrity and neurovascular status of restrained extremities and determine the need for continued use. Supine position is avoided to decrease aspiration risk. Quick release knots are used to attach restraints to parts of the bed frame that move with bed position changes. The nurse is caring for a client receiving IVPB azithromycin. Which client data obtained by the nurse should be reported to the healthcare provider, HCP, prior to administering any additional doses? 1. Currently nauseated and vomited once. 2. Decreased white blood cell, WBC, count. 3. Prolonged QT interval. 4. Temperature of 101.4 F, 38.6 C. Correct answer. All macrolide antibiotics, like azithromycin, erythromycin, clarithromycin, can cause a prolonged QT interval, which may lead to sudden cardiac death due to torsades de points. Therefore, an electrocardiogram, ECG, should be monitored. Concurrent use of macrolide antibiotics with other drugs that prolong QT interval like amiodarone, sotalol, haloperidol, zapracidone. Azole antifungals will further increase this risk. Macrolides can also cause hepatotoxicity when taken in high doses or in combination with other hepatoxic medications such as acetaminophen, phenothiazines, and sulfonamides. Elevation of aspartate transaminase and alanine transaminase levels, liver enzymes, may indicate that hepatotoxicity is occurring. And the nurse should report these results to the HCP. Option 1. Nausea and vomiting can be side effects of azithromycin. They are not as concerning as the adverse reaction of prolonged QT interval. Option 2. A decrease in the WBC count would be expected as infection is resolving. Option 4. Fever may be present in a client with an infection.
The nurse should use as needed acetaminophen cautiously in a client also receiving azithromycin due to the risk of hepatotoxicity. Educational Objective Macrolide antibiotics, like erythromycin. Azithromycin, clarithromycin, can cause QT prolongation, which can lead to life-threatening arrhythmias, torsades de points. They can also be hepatoxic, therefore. The nurse should monitor liver function tests and an ECG and report significant results to the HCP. Which actions by a registered nurse are reportable to the State Board of Nursing? Select all that apply. 1. Administering hydromorphone without a prescription. 2. Being habitually tardy to work. 3. Documenting an intervention that was not performed. 4. Stealing narcotics. 5. Walking off duty in the middle of a shift. Correct answer. The National Council of State Boards of Nursing advises any individual who has knowledge of a potential violation of a nursing law or rule to file a complaint with the appropriate State Board of Nursing. A nurse should be knowledgeable concerning the presiding board's stance on mandatory reporting and which actions are considered reportable. In general, Reportable actions may include any behavior by a licensed nurse that is unsafe, unethical, incompetent, impaired, by substances or a mental or physical condition, or in violation of nursing law. Practicing outside of the scope of the license is reportable even if the practice meets quality standards. Option 1. Documenting an intervention that was not performed is considered falsification of records regarding client care and is a reportable action. Option 3. Stealing narcotics is a criminal offense, a violation punishable by the state that can result in prison or a fine, and is reportable in all states. Many states offer an alternate rehabilitation program to nurses who diverted or abused drugs. Option 4. Abandonment, like leaving without proper replacement of personnel and transfer of responsibility for client care, is reportable in all states. Option 5. Option 2. Work habits are handled under the facility's management policies and are often part of the criteria for discipline and or termination. If the facility has 24-hour care, the offgoing nurse cannot leave without someone assuming responsibility for the clients or waiting for the tardy nurse. Educational Objective Nurse offenses reportable to the State Board of Nursing include criminal acts, such as theft, practicing outside of the scope, falsification of records, and client abandonment. Any individual may file a complaint regarding an action that is potentially unethical, incompetent, impaired, or in violation of nursing law. The nurse is verifying the medical history of a client who is admitted for a scheduled labor induction. Which client statement should prompt the nurse to request further evaluation for a primary cesarean birth from the healthcare provider? 1. A vacuum was used to help deliver my last baby because the baby's heart rate was dropping. 2. I have an atrial septal defect that has never given me any problems. And I plan to receive an epidural during labor. 3. I lost my acyclovir prescription, and I've noticed lesions on my labia that are stinging and burning. 4. I took enoxaparin during this pregnancy due to a history of blood clots, and my last dose was yesterday. Correct answer. Genital herpes, an incurable sexually transmitted infection caused by herpes simplex virus, HS, is characterized by painful, vesicular lesions that form ulcers that crust over. Clients with a history of genital herpes are prescribed antivirals, acyclovir, around 36 weeks gestation to prevent outbreaks prior to labor. Clients with active genital herpes infections, lesions, or prodromal symptoms, like pain, burning, tingling, require a cesarean birth to prevent transmission to the fetus, neonatal HS infection. The nurse should notify the healthcare provider of the client's symptoms and request further evaluation to help facilitate an appropriate plan of care, cesarean birth, option 3. Option 1. Often. 
The use of a vacuum or forces during birth is due to factors that do not influence future births, like abnormal fetal heart rate, maternal exhaustion. Therefore, a history of a vacuum or forceps-assisted birth is not an indication for cesarean birth in subsequent pregnancies. Options 2 and 4, most cardiac diseases, atrial septal defect, and a history of venous thrombus are not indications for cesarean birth. These conditions increase the risk of complications during and following a cesarean birth because of the blood loss and immobility associated with surgery. Educational Objective Clients with an active genital herpes infection or prodromal symptoms require further evaluation for a cesarean birth to prevent infection of the fetus. History of a vacuum-assisted birth An asymptomatic atrial septal defect and venous thrombus are not indications for cesarean birth. The nurse dons personal protective equipment, PPE, before providing care for a client in airborne transmission-based precautions. Place the steps for donning PPE in the appropriate sequence. All options must be used. Hand hygiene, gown, goggles or face shield, gloves, mask or respirator. Correct answer. PPE for the healthcare worker protects the mucous membranes, airways, skin, and clothing from contact with potentially infectious agents. The category of transmission-based precautions, e.g., contact, droplet, airborne, required determines the type of PPE that the healthcare worker will wear. The exact procedure for donning and removing PPE varies with the level of precautions required. Guidelines are provided by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC and by Institution Policy and Procedure. The sequence for donning PPE includes Hand hygiene Gown Fully cover torso from neck to knees, arms to end of wrists, and wrap around back. Fasten in back of neck and waist. Mask or respirator Secure ties or elastic bands at middle of head and neck. Fit flexible band to nose bridge. Fit snugly to face and below chin. Fit check respirator. Goggles or face shield. Place over face and eyes and adjust fit. May be combined with mask, visor. Gloves. Don and extend to cover wrist of isolation gown. Educational objective. The CDC suggests the following sequence for donning PPE. Hand hygiene, gown, mask or respirator. Goggles or face shield and gloves. The nurse is helping a 10-year-old child hospitalized for vaso-occlusive sickle cell crisis to plan activities for the day. What is an appropriate activity to suggest? 1. Doing puzzles in the activity room. 2. Playing an action video game. 3. Reading a new children's book. 4. Walking through the unit hallways. Correct answer. Vasoclusive sickle cell crisis causes severe pain due to the occlusion of small blood vessels from increased BC sickling. Treatment includes round-the-clock pain management with opioids, IV fluids, bed rest to decrease energy expenditure and oxygen demand, and non-pharmacologic pain-reducing strategies, like guided imagery, warm soaks, positioning. Age-specific activities are important to include in the hospitalized child's plan of care. Activities that effectively distract from pain while maintaining bed rest and promoting growth and development are ideal for children experiencing sickle cell crisis. For a school-aged child, such activities include watching movies and or TV and reading. Option 3. Option 1. A child must be on bed rest when in vaso-occlusive sickle cell crisis. Doing puzzles in the activity room does not maintain bed rest and would be too stimulating for the child. Option 2. Age-appropriate video games can effectively distract from pain. However, an exciting action video game can increase oxygen expenditure. In addition, vaso-occlusive ischemic pain often affects the joints, hands, making games that require hand dexterity difficult. 
Option 4. Walking through the unit hallways can increase physical activity, reduce boredom, and provide stress release but is too physically demanding for a client with vaso-occlusive crisis. In addition, pain would likely discourage the child's participation. Educational Objective Activities that effectively distract from pain, maintain bed rest, and promote growth and development are important in the care of children hospitalized with vaso-occlusive sickle cell crisis. For a school-aged child, such activities include watching movies and reading. The nurse observes a client who is postoperative left total knee replacement use a cane. Which action by the client indicates an understanding of the correct technique when walking down the stairs? 1. Descends with the cane on the step first, followed by the left leg, and then the right leg. 2. Descends with the cane on the step first, followed by the right leg, and then the left leg. 3. Descends with the left leg on the step first, followed by the cane, and then the right leg. 4. Descends with the right leg on the step first, followed by the left leg, and then the cane. Correct answer. To prevent falls after a total knee replacement, clients should use a cane to provide maximum support when climbing up and down any stairs. Clients should hold the cane on the stronger side and move the cane before moving the weaker leg, regardless of the direction. Clients must also keep two points of support on the floor at all times, like both feet, foot and cane. When descending stairs, the client should lead with the cane. Bring the weaker leg down next, in this client, it is the left leg. Finally, step down with the stronger leg, option 1. When ascending stairs, the client should step up with the stronger leg first. Move the cane next, while bearing weight on the stronger leg. Finally, move the weaker leg. To remember the order, use the mnemonic, up with the good and down with the bad. The cane always moves before the weaker leg. Options 2, 3, and 4. These options do not provide enough support to the weaker leg when descending. Educational objective. To prevent falls when descending the stairs using a cane. The client should lead with the cane, follow with the weaker leg, and then step down with the stronger leg. The home health nurse visits a client with atrial fibrillation who is newly prescribed digoxin 0.25 mg orally on even numbered days. Which of the following client statements show that teaching has been effective? Select all that apply. 1. I need to call the healthcare provider, HCP, if I have trouble reading. 2. I need to check my blood pressure before taking my medicine. 3. I should call the HCP if I develop nausea and vomiting. 4. Should check my heart rate prior to taking this medication. 5. I will call the HCP if I feel dizzy and lightheaded. Correct answer. Digoxin, linoxin, is a cardiac glycoside used to treat heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Cardiac glycosides have positive enotropic effects, increased cardiac output, and negative chronotropic effects, decreased heart rate. However, drug toxicity is common due to digoxin having narrow therapeutic range levels, 0.5 to 2.0 nanogram per milliliter. Cardiac arrhythmias are the most dangerous symptoms. Digoxin toxicity can result in bradycardia and heart block, which can cause dizziness or lightheadedness. Option 5. Clients are instructed to check their pulse and if it is low, less than 60 per minute, or has skipped beats to hold the medication and notify the healthcare provider. Option 4. Other manifestations of digoxin toxicity that clients should report include visual symptoms, like alterations in color vision, scotomus, blindness, option 1. Gastrointestinal symptoms, like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, frequently the earliest symptoms, option 3. Neurologic manifestations, like lethargy, fatigue, weakness, confusion.
Option 2, there is no need to routinely check blood pressure before taking digoxin as it does not affect blood pressure. Clients should check the pulse prior to administration. Educational Objective Cardiac glycosides, digoxin, have positive enotropic effects, like increased cardiac output, and negative chronotropic effects, like decreased heart rate. Clients are instructed to check their pulse before administration and to report gastrointestinal, like anorexia, nausea, neurologic, and cardiac symptoms and visual changes. The nurse is caring for a 10-year-old client diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The client is at risk for which complication? 1. Delayed physical development. 2. Intrusive thoughts. 3. Low self-esteem. 4. Paranoia. Correct answer. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by inattention, distractibility, and or hyperactivity. Children experiencing hyperactivity are typically restless, have difficulty remaining seated, talk excessively, blurt out answers, and interrupt others. Inattention is characterized by a reduced ability to focus, distractibility, and failure to complete tasks. A diagnosis of ADHD can be made when a child, age less than 17 years, exhibits multiple symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsiveness and or inattentiveness for at least 6 months. Children may struggle to control impulsive behavior and exhibit emotional dysregulation, like low frustration tolerance, irritability, anger outbursts, when unable to meet demands and challenges. Symptoms are typically persistent and can lead to impaired social skills and peer rejection. This results in feelings of isolation and low self-esteem. Option 3. Option 1. ADHD is not associated with delayed physical growth unless children taking prescribed stimulant medications do not maintain a proper diet. Option 2. Intrusive thoughts or urges, impulses or unwanted thoughts associated with obsessive-compulsive disorder, not ADHD. Option 4, paranoia is associated with schizophrenia and certain personality disorders, like schizotypal personality disorder. Clients with ADHD do not have an increased risk for developing paranoia unless they take high doses of stimulant medications, medication misuse. Educational Objective Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, is a neurodevelopmental disorder characterized by inattention, distractibility, and or hyperactivity. Symptoms are typically persistent and can lead to impaired social skills and peer rejection, resulting in feelings of isolation and poor self-esteem. A nurse is caring for a client at 30 weeks gestation who is admitted for preterm labor. Which of the following interventions should the nurse anticipate? Select all that apply. 1. Administering IM betamethasone. 2. Administering penicillin via IV piggyback. 3. Assisting with artificial rupture of membranes. 4. Initiating IV magnesium sulfate. 5. Obtaining fetal heart tones once per shift. Correct answer. Preterm labor, PTL, is defined as progressive cervical dilation and or effacement resulting from uterine contractions before term gestation. The nurse should anticipate the following interventions for clients in PTL before 34 weeks gestation. Administering IM antenatal glucocorticoids, like betamethasone. Dexamethasone, to stimulate fetal lung maturation and promote surfactant development, option 1. Administering antibiotics, penicillin, to prevent group B streptococcus infection in the newborn if preterm birth occurs, option 2. Initiating an IV magnesium sulfate infusion for fetal neuroprotection if at less than 32 weeks gestation, option 4. Giving tocolytic medications, like nifedipine, indomethacin, to suppress uterine activity. 
which allows antenatal glucocorticoids time to have a therapeutic effect. Monitoring pertinent laboratory results, including cultures for vaginal or urinary tract infection and group B streptococcus. If obtained, option 3, artificial rupture of membranes, AROM, or amniotomy, is performed to augment labor or assess amniotic fluid in clients who are at term gestation. For clients in PTL, the goal is to prolong pregnancy if possible. Therefore, AROM is contraindicated. Option 5. Clients with suspected PTL should be placed on continuous fetal monitoring to assess for increasing frequency and duration of contractions and to evaluate fetal tolerance of labor. Continuous fetal monitoring is also required if the client is receiving a magnesium sulfate infusion. Educational Objective. Preterm labor is progressive cervical dilation and or effacement resulting from uterine contractions before term gestation. The nurse should anticipate several interventions, including administration of IM antenatal glucocorticoids, antibiotics, and IV magnesium sulfate. If you like more videos like this, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.